Take your Bible, turn to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. And um, it's good to be here this morning. Good to have our visitor from uh, around the Philadelphia area, although she told us that she's not all the way from Philadelphia. You, you were from originally Puerto Rico? Yeah, I was from Puerto Rico. And then to New York? Yeah, you're lucky we let you in on that one. Oh, there's some good, there's some good people in New York. Amen, and oh, it's just good to have you with us today. Isaiah chapter 11. Let's read the text this morning. Um, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. All seven spirits right there for you. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. When it says the breath of his lips and the rod of his mouth, he's talking about the Bible. Amen. The Bible, this, is why, this is why lost people, wicked people, unrighteous people, people who say they're atheists. I don't believe there is an atheist in this world. I think everybody down deep inside knows that there's a God and they're scared to death. They are scared to death, and they don't, they, if they think they can put him out of their mind and put him out of the minds of everybody else, they think they can kill him off, I guess. Uh, take your Bible, turn to Isaiah chapter 4, uh, just very quickly. I'm going to point something out to you that has to do with the message this morning. Uh, Isaiah, or excuse me, Revelation chapter 4. Did I tell you Isaiah? Uh-huh. It's one of those days. That's why I put the verses on the screen, so you'll go, hey, uh, Pastor, you got the wrong place. Uh, Revelation chapter 4, after this I looked and beheld, uh, behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet, talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will shew thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. You know, I like that. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So what was on the throne? One was. You know what the NIV says here? Someone. That just, that, don't, that ain't right. That just is not right. All the new Bibles messed that one up. Someone was sitting on it, they said. Uh, if they don't know who it is now, they're fixing to find out. Um, verse 3, and he that sat... What's to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone? And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. Round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now look at verse 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now I want you to notice now the seven spirits of God are, are pictured here as seven lamps or uh, Jesus, uh, John references in chapter 1, seven golden candlesticks. So what, what the point I'm making is the only light inside the tabernacle was from these seven candlesticks. The only light uh, here in Isaiah 4 came from those seven candlesticks. We use the word light uh, as, a, as sort of a, a spiritual context to say that, well, he's got light in him. That means he's got the Holy Spirit that is guiding his life. He's not walking blindly throughout this life. He is being led by the Spirit of God, and that Spirit of God is a spirit of, and what we're going to talk about today, a spirit of wisdom. Now I want you to look up on the screen. Uh, I like this kind of stuff. 
The word wise, it, see the book of Proverbs is called the book of wise sayings. It's written by Solomon. The word wise is used 66 times in the book of Proverbs. Number of books in the Bible. All the forms of the word know, such as know, known, knoweth, knowing, knowledge, 66 times in the book of Proverbs. All the forms of the word understand, understand, understandeth, understanding, etc., 66 times in the book of Proverbs. That just blows my mind because these three are linked together. And as I'm preaching on one this morning, I'm actually preaching on, uh, on all three of them. And usually the order goes like this. Before you can get wisdom, you must have understanding. Before you have understanding, you must have knowledge. So it goes in this order. Knowledge, understanding, and then wisdom. And I'll show you how the Bible uh, lays that out for us after we pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray, God, that you would send light down from heaven. Uh, Lord, through your word, your word truly is the lamp that uh, guides our path. And Father, there's no reason why any of us should ever remain lost if we are in your kingdom, God, because we have the light of your word to shine a light everywhere that we go. We have the light of your word shining down in our hearts so that we know who we are, what we are, what we're made of, what we're capable of. And I pray, dear God, that you would just shine the light now upon your people this morning, upon those, Lord, who need it. Maybe there's somebody listening today that's not born again, they're not saved. I pray, dear God, that you would shine the light down upon them. They would see their condition. They would see, Lord, in the future where they're headed. And that, God, it is not too late to alter that. That they can turn their life to you right now. And, Father, you'll shine light upon them. And they will know beyond any doubt whatsoever that their new home is now heaven for eternity. Father, bless your word this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Now, uh, take your Bible, turn to Exodus. There's a couple places here in Exodus. So what is the, the first one that we're dealing with is the word, the spirit of knowledge. Okay, I'm, let me see, I'm all messed up here. Hang on, let me back up here. There we go. It's the spirit of wisdom. And as I mentioned a while ago, the spirit of wisdom uh, and the spirit of understanding and the spirit of knowledge, they're always going to go together. And as I'm talking about one, I'm talking about the others. Now that doesn't mean that next Sunday I'm not going to preach another message like on the spirit of uh, understanding or the spirit of knowledge, whichever comes next. I think it's the spirit of knowledge or understanding comes next. Uh, but as I'm preaching this on the spirit of wisdom, it equally applies to both understanding and to knowledge. God wants us to be wise in our lives. The opposite of being wise is what? Foolishness. How many of you have ever, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. You ever been caught up in foolishness? Been a fool, yes. Said foolish things, yes. Made foolish decisions, yes. What is that saying now? It goes over the internet. Uh, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. I don't know if you've seen that or not, but that, that's what I've seen. We've all done foolish things. We've all, uh, in, in one way, we've had the wisdom that tells us not to do or not to say or not to be part of certain things, but then our flesh takes over and we go and we do foolish things. And foolish things, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Somebody who does foolish things and makes foolish decisions and lives in a foolish way, they're living as if the God of the Bible doesn't exist. Now, they may say, oh, I still believe in God. But it's a God that they have carved out in their mind and in their heart. And that God does not resemble the God that this Bible presents. So that God will allow them to keep certain sins in their life and they justify it. Oh, I'm doing this, but it's okay because I know God still loves me. Or I do that, or, or I'm living this way, or I'm living that way, or 
I, you know, I think this way or I think that way, but it's okay because uh, what I believe about God, God doesn't judge me. God doesn't, uh, uh, th and I love this when some people say, uh, uh, God is love and God wouldn't send anybody to hell. God's not sending them. They're earning it. The wages of sin is death. When you, went, when you wind up in hell for eternity, nobody puts you there except you. I mentioned in Sunday school that I watched some of these judges online because they started doing the online thing because of COVID. And some of them are still doing it. And uh, there's some good judges out there, I can tell you. And um, they're the ones who will tell these people, listen, I'm not putting you in jail. I'm not putting you in prison. I'm not the one sentencing you. I'm not the one who did what you did. You did it. You, you violated your probation 10 times. You keep getting drunk. You say you're not going to get drunk anymore. And your lawyer said, Judge, if they just give them one more chance now, they really got it. Now they're really going to get, get on the straight path. Sorry, I didn't give them 10 chances. And they've blown it every, every one of them. So I'm not the one doing this to them. It is them that are doing it. Would you agree with that? Amen. For the most part, people who are in jail and prison in this country, I know there's exceptions, but for the most part, people who are in prison and who are in jail in this country deserved it. They had it coming. They could have made better choices. They always say, well, I made a mistake. No, a mistake is that you, I don't know, accidentally gave, that you gave somebody a ride that you didn't know, and he had pockets full of heroin, which makes you an accomplice. That's a mistake. But when you bought the heroin from that guy, and now you got it in your pocket, that's not a mistake. That's a choice. You chose to live this way. You chose to do this, and now you have to face the consequences. The spirit of wisdom is what guides us away from that stupidity and away from that foolishness. If we would just use the wisdom that God gives us in His Word, we would avoid a lifetime of heartache, shame, reproach. People that when they bring our name up, do they talk about us favorably or do they talk about us in an ill manner? And if they talk about you in an ill manner, do you deserve it? You know, I've, I used to tell people, I, I don't know why I quit. I ought to still tell you this. People say, I just don't like people lying about me. Well, listen, I'd rather have them lie about me than in some ways tell the truth about me. You know what I'm saying? You, you just admitted you did foolish things. You just said you brought reproach to yourself and to your your uh, reputation, well, if people go around telling the truth about you, they're going to tell that kind of stuff. And you don't want that around. So I'd rather, in some cases, I'd rather have them lie to me. The spirit of wisdom is needful for the work of the Lord. In Exodus chapter 28, the Bible says, Thou shalt speak unto all those that are wise-hearted, not wisdom in the mind. Wisdom in the mind usually is man's wisdom. And I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. It's usually man's wisdom. It's usually how man sees it and not God. But they have a wise heart, which means that God has instilled in them, in their heart, wisdom. And remember, your heart has the same type of cells in it as your brain. It has neurons. When the Bible talks about your heart believing things or your heart thinking things or you, you meditated in your heart, that's not just a metaphor, it's real. I don't know exactly how my heart thinks, but it has the same type of cells as my brain does, so I know it does. And I just take what the Bible says, being literal now, that I indict a good matter in my heart or I meditate on these things in my heart or I pray in my heart, I speak to God. When I was being electrocuted under my house, I couldn't talk. I couldn't cross myself. I couldn't do anything. I was just froze for a minute. But what I was praying, I was praying in the only part of me that wasn't frozen. 
That was my heart. And it wasn't beaten, but it wasn't frozen either, all right? So now in Exodus 28, he said, uh, uh, Thou shalt speak unto all those that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Now, God talks about, a, he mentioned here verbatim the spirit of wisdom. You, what you'll see in these uh, different spirits is that if you look for them in the Bible, if you like you type in the spirit of wisdom or the spirit of counsel or the spirit of understanding, you'll probably find that exact phrase in the scriptures somewhere. And here, God wanted it, uh, Moses wanted it, God wanted it, for the people who were going to build all the different pieces that went into the tabernacle because God wanted it, God had to have it exactly the way it was in heaven, had to be exactly the way it was down on this earth. I mean, what did, what did Jesus pray? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so if God's will in the tabernacle, he has a certain way in the tabernacle in heaven, that means he must have that same way in the tabernacle down on the earth. And for those who were putting those things together, it, take, it took a spirit of wisdom. And I will tell you, having I've grown up in church, I've tried to live for the Lord all my life, haven't, and sometimes have done a, a good example of it. I've made mistakes. I've done foolish things. And I can tell you, there's nothing like God giving you wisdom, especially if somebody comes to you and they say to you, I've got a problem and I need help. And I don't know what to do. I don't know where to turn. Can I tell you what my problem is? Yes. And when I say yes to you, that's my mouth indicating to you that I'm shooting up flares to heaven. God help! You need to help me here. I'm going to say something to them. I, I need it to come from heaven. I need a spirit of wisdom in me so that when I counsel you, I'm telling you the right thing to do. I can mess up and tell you something that may not, A, be relevant to what you're going through, or B, totally wrong for you. And I don't want to get some things wrong. And I need a spirit of wisdom to preach, to teach, counsel, make decisions of what is good for this church, what is best for this church, how to lead this church, what we should be doing, what we should not be doing. And I can tell you that the time that I was going to have a heavy metal rock and roll band up on this stage, I was not using the spirit of wisdom. It was foolishness. It was pride. It was, it was sin. No way out of it. It was sin. Exodus 31, 3, And I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom. And notice he says all three of them here. In wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. In other words, that's the guy that God hired to design and work on all the, the furniture that was, went into the tabernacle. In Exodus 35, and he hath filled him with the Spirit of God, in, he says it again, in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. So what I'm going to tell you is, You'll never know how somebody that you know might be needful of some wisdom to guide them in their life. And if they come to you and you tell them something stupid, you know what? That's going to be on you. If you read uh, Ezekiel 33, Ezekiel 33 gives the requirements uh, for a watchman who is going to watch over the people of Israel. And he says, if... If he see the sword coming and he blows not the trumpet, when the sword comes and it takes the people away, it took them away because of their own sin and their own iniquity. But I will require their blood at your hand because you knew that you needed to sound the alarm, blow the trumpet, Give them the word of God to say, You're, listen, this is coming. This is coming to your life. You need to get things right with God. You didn't do it. 
Therefore, their blood am I going to require at your hands. And I can tell you, I've got blood on my hands already. I knew a guy at the church I pastored at Richwoods. He was a deacon's son. And he was out of church when I got there. Uh, he started liking me, so he started coming to church. And one Sunday morning, we were, we, were, we were just into the singing service, hadn't even started preaching already, and all of a sudden, him and his wife come down to the altar, and I'm going, boy, this is church, you know. Boy, we're, and I prayed with them, and we had a bunch of people down at the altar, and we just had one of those services, you know. Just God came in, mopped up sin everywhere, and, and, and great, you know. And I went out to visit them and talk to them, you know, and try to encourage them and fellowship with them a little bit. And after about, oh, eight, ten months, something like that, uh, well, he brought up something in Sunday school. And he said, uh, you know, Brother Mike, he said, I believe it doesn't really matter what you do as long as you do it in moderation. And I knew what was behind that, and he's talking about drinking. And um, I, I talked to his mom and dad later, and they said, yeah, he's asked us about it. He's asked his older brother. His older brother wasn't in church. His older brother was a drinker. And I caught on to what he was doing. He was going to everybody that he knew. And if he went to somebody and they said, listen, you've got a problem with that drinking. You've left it once. You need to leave it alone so you can have a chance at having some kind of decent life and a decent marriage and raise your kids in a decent house. I mean, people were telling him that. I was telling him that. His mother was telling him that. But he went to his brother. His brother said, I don't care if you drink. You know, if you, as long as you don't get drunk and beat your wife, as long as you don't get drunk and beat your kids or, you know, run out on them or whatever, as long as you don't get drunk, well, then it's okay. You can do whatever you want to. Just do it in moderation. It'll be all right. He was looking for a fool to give him a fool's advice and the fool gave him the advice and that's the advice that he followed. He didn't listen to the wise people. The wise people were telling him, listen, uh, the wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. That's a verse out of the Bible. Give him some wisdom. But he chose foolishness and to follow after those who gave him foolishness. And if somebody ever comes to you in this life because they know you go to church and they ask you something about their life or what's going on in their life, you don't want to offend them. You want to keep being friends with them. You want them to be nice to you so you can be nice to them. And you tell them whatever they want to hear. You haven't helped them. You just condemned them is what you did. They're asking for the truth. They're asking for somebody who will stand up to them and tell them the truth. Listen, what you're doing is wrong. I love you, and I, I care about you, and I care about your soul, and I, I don't want to see you messed up in life. So listen, I've got some Bible verses here. I'm going to read to you. This is what God says about it. Give them what God says about it. That's a spirit of wisdom right there. Whatever choice they make after that, that's up to them. Now, you might want to write this down. I spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars going to Bible college. And I didn't learn this there. I learned it later on. Knowledge is knowing God's commandments. If God says thou shalt not commit adultery, then thou shalt not commit adultery. If God says thou shalt not steal, and you take something that doesn't belong to you, that's stealing. If God says thou shalt not steal, and you lie on your tax return, that's stealing. You say, well, it's the government. I mean, they're stealing from us. Okay, but who does vengeance belong to? It's not your place. Okay? Knowing is knowing God's commandments. And if God tells you to do something and you willfully disobey that, something ain't right. Something's not right. Learn the Bible. Learn what it says. That means that you read it. You think about it. That means you come to service and hear the word preached. You come to Sunday school, hear the word taught. You listen 
to what's being taught. And if what's being taught comes out of that Bible, then you give heed to that. That's knowing. That's knowledge. Number two, understanding. Is understanding that God will punish those who violate his commandments and reward those who keep his commandments. That's understanding. It's, if one thing if God says, thou shalt not uh, bear false witness against thy neighbor, but then God turns around and gives you what will happen to you if you bear false witness against your neighbor. Now you understand God didn't just say it as a suggestion. He meant it as a rule. And if I break this rule, then I understand the consequences that will come to me for breaking this rule. Likewise, if you do what's right in the eyes of the Lord, not in your own eyes, because remember, your eyes see foolishness. I couldn't tell you how many times I've had church people say to me, I don't see anything wrong with that. Doesn't matter what it is. Oh, I, just, I just don't see anything wrong with that. Their teenage daughter running around 15 years old, you can see most of the bottom side of her backside because her shorts are too small. And if you dare say anything, you'll get a parent saying, well, I don't see anything wrong with that. That's because you're not looking at her rear end. But everybody else is. No, I, listen, I'm not the kind of preacher that just beats everybody over the head with how you should dress and how you should look. And, but there are things that are wrong. Common sense things. you got a 14, 15-year-old daughter and she runs around with that, that stuff on. You are asking for trouble to visit your house. You say, how, did, how, how can I say something like that? Knowledge, understanding, wisdom. Okay, I've been around. I'm not dumb. So understanding that God will punish those who violate his commandments, reward those who keep his commandments. And then wisdom. You are wise enough to decide to turn away from sin. Also, wise enough to maintain a holy life and to avoid the temptation. So let's say that uh, let's say that you on your way home you stop off at a place and uh, you have you a beer before you go home. Well, that's not wise, but you're not doing anything else, and you don't see anything wrong with it. But while you're there, the devil set up a woman that she's going to start getting fresh with you. And part of you is saying, oh, I'm married, I shouldn't, shouldn't be around that. But there is another part of you saying, boy, this is going to be fun. Now, what would wisdom say to you? Would it say to you, there's nothing wrong with, you know, having a little fun on the side? That's not what wisdom would say. Wisdom would say, I need to stop going to bars. I need to quit going to them places. I told you about the guy I used to work with. He was a bad drunk. And he would lay out after work. He was a drywall taper. And after work, they, I mean, they, him and his buddy would drive an hour and a half down to Farmington uh, once they left the job site and get down there, and then he would go straight to the pool hall and play pool till 1, 2 o'clock in the morning and come home drunk. He had a wife and three daughters at home that he never saw, and his wife kept threatening to leave, threatening to leave, threatening to kick him out, and finally she kicked him out, and he came to me crying one Monday, and he said, my wife, I want to get back in with my wife. I want to. And I told him what to do. I said, listen, you need to, you need to prove to your wife that you're going to quit this time and you're not going back to it, and maybe, maybe it's not too late. Maybe when she sees that you're for real this time, she might let you back in. But I can't give you any promise. So the next weekend went by and he came to work the next Monday and said, I found a solution to my problem. What is that? He said, I found a girl at the, at the, at the uh, pool hall. 
She drinks as much as I do. She plays pool. That's not wisdom. That's foolishness. Wisdom is you, you, you know enough to turn away from the sin and you're wise enough to maintain a holy life by avoiding the temptation altogether. So if you have a problem with drinking, you don't get around people that drink. You don't go to parties. You don't go to barbecues. You don't go to people's house that you know are going to be drinking. You don't do it. Because if it's a problem, guess what's going to happen before the, before the sun goes down? You're going to be drinking again. And it won't take much either. And you can take that and apply it to whatever situation it is that you have going on in your life. You're either going to make a foolish decision and be buried in your sin. Or you're going to make a wise decision and God will lift you up out of it. Amen. Let's look at Joshua. Book of Deuteronomy, Joshua is going to take over for Moses. What was it that Joshua needed in order to take over that? Anybody who is in any kind of authority in their life, whether you're a husband, whether you're a single mom, whether you are um, uh, somebody who manages people at a work site, at an office, or just whatever it is. You've got a family, or you're pastor at church. I know pastors... Preachers sometimes will listen to the sermons that I preach and so on, so this is for them. Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, as, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. In other words, God told Joshua, he said, I'm going to give you the spirit of wisdom like I gave it to Moses, and the people are going to follow you just like they follow Moses, and they're going to do whatever you tell them to do. And if you are in any kind of responsible situation in life, and I don't, I don't care if it's just maybe, uh, maybe you work for AT&T and, and you work in the office somewhere or whatever it is. In any area of life, you are going to need wisdom to work through the problems that come through there. And I can tell you that this Bible, literally, it really does have a solution for every problem in life that you will ever face. I mean, God's got it all figured out already, and he wrote the solutions for us right here in the book. You would be amazed once you start reading the Bible at just how relevant the Word of God is to your everyday life. I mean, God will, young people that are listening to me out there, wherever you are, God will show you who is right for you and who isn't right for you. The woman that I had picked when I was 18 years old Going to Bible college out here, the woman that I picked to be my wife out there, we didn't get married, thank God, she up and left me. How dare she do that? And then I come home, Lisa says, I want to date Mike Hoggard. So we go on a date, and the rest is history, 37 years later, thank God. And that woman that I picked out there, she's now an assistant pastor of a church. And I'm like, Good grief. Well, God, you saved me from something. And God says, you better believe I did. Amen. God, hey, wisdom. God give you wisdom to save you from yourself. Amen. Daniel chapter 1. Turn there. Look there. Boy, there's a lot here. Notice this situation with Daniel. Um, Shagrat, Meshach, and Abednego, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah was their Hebrew names. The king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding. See that words again? Wisdom, knowledge, understanding. See how they're all, they're all together then, aren't they? I mean, it's like every time you look at one, you're looking at all of them. Understanding science. Understanding science. Science will tell you the earth is not flat. Science will tell you it be round. That's what science will tell you. Understanding science. And such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and on whom they might teach the learning and the tongue 
of the Chaldeans. So they're looking, they're going to bring the children of Israel into the king's palace and he's going to train them in their language. He's going to train them in their ways. He's going to train them so they can be counselors to the king or, or help lead the kingdom. In Daniel chapter 1 verse 8, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Daniel didn't know but what the king ate pork every Tuesday and Thursday. And Daniel was going to say, I, listen, we're not eating that. That's against God's rules. We're not doing that. I don't know what meat is set before me. I don't know what kind of wine that is, but God told me to stay away from wine. And so I'm just, I'm just not going to do this. And so you know the story. He goes to the chief of the eunuchs and he says, me and these four guys, or these three guys, we're not going to do that. We're going to follow God. And of course the eunuch is sweating bullets. He's like, man, if I go to the king with this, he's going to cut my head off first. But look at verse 17, as for the four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wit. Look at that, and understanding and wisdom and knowledge and understanding and wisdom and knowledge and wisdom and knowledge and understanding. He keeps saying it together all over the place. Understanding and all visions and dreams. Well, that came in handy for Daniel, didn't it? Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king communed with them, and among them... Uh, all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. By the way, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, all four of them have God's name in their name. Danny, El, El is God. Hananiah, Yah, Jah, or Yah is Jehovah. Azariah, Jah, Jehovah. Mishael is God's name. All of them. There, therefore stood they before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than... How many commandments are there? Isn't that something? They decided to keep the ten commandments, and God made them ten times smarter, ten times stronger, ten times bigger, and ten times better looking than all of the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. You see, having the spirit of wisdom pays off. When you decide, see we decide as Christians, we decide to, to live some of the world's way because we want our worldly friends to not think of us as these right-wing fundamentalist crazy Christians that are weird. We want our friends and our family members to not think there's something wrong with us. So we live in some ways worldly ways before them so we don't offend them or we don't look weird to them. That's not wise. You'll never know how God might use you, if you will live God's way, how God would use you to save that person's life or save their soul. But if you keep deciding to live after the world so you don't look too fundamentalist, they never will. They'll say, well, he's doing the same thing I'm doing. Why should I go to them? They're not any smarter than I am. In Daniel 5, there is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods and in the days of thy father light and understanding and wisdom. There it is again. Like the wisdom of the gods was found in him whom the king Nebuchadnezzar thy father, thy, the king, I say, thy father made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. So in verse 14, I have even, this is uh, Bel, Belshazzar, I have even heard of thee that the spirit of the gods is in thee and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee and we know the story that it was only Daniel who knew the handwriting on the wall and the wise men the astrologers have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known unto me the interpretation thereof but they could not show the interpretation of the thing in other words God will uh, God will not allow a person's lost friends to be able to help them He'll allow you 
And I'm going to tell you a personal story about that in, that happened. Most of you know that back uh, about eight years ago, something like that, um, my pain management doctor, the first time we went to see him, he decided to get me hooked on pain pills. That was back when we know for a fact that all those pain doctors were getting kickbacks from the pharmaceutical companies. I did not need all of that Percocet that he was giving me every day. I did not need that. But he gave it to me, and I guess it's just in my nature. And uh, so after about six months of that, uh, they, he said, well, you got to get you off of these. So they sent me to, it's an outpatient thing. I went to this clinic, and three times a week, I did not want to do this, but three times a week I had to sit in a group thing, and uh, lo and behold, God has a sense of humor. The guy leading the group therapy uh, was a former preacher. He had been to Bible seminary, been to Bible college. He had lived my background. And I did not want him telling everybody in that group that I was a pastor. And that's the first thing out of his mouth. Uh, Mike here is with us. He's a pastor of a church. <sighs> I did not want him to say that. I was hoping to get out of there without anybody knowing who I was. But God had a different plan. There was a young man there that was a bad alcoholic. And on the last day, I had to do this for like six weeks, and on the last day, when it's your last day and you've, you've made it all the way through, um, the guy would go around the table and have everybody that's in that group say things about you to encourage you um, after you left the group. And um, I really did not understand the kind of impact that God was going to use me for. But when it came to, his name was Brian, I think, or no, Matt, it was Matt. When, uh, when it came Matt's turn, he said to me, he said to the group, he said, I have never heard anybody say the things that I've heard you say in this group. And he said, there's things that you spoke about that, he said, I was just in awe of the wisdom that you have. And he said, you have affected my life. And he said, I'll never forget you. Oh, man, I'm in tears. So after the meeting... I went and got in my car, and I'd, I'd tarried a little bit, and then I went and got in my car, and I was driving uh, down 21 there, and I saw Matt walking on the side of the road. So I pulled up to him, I said, hey, Matt, you, you want to ride? I said, I'll take you anywhere you want to go. No, I'm fine, I'm fine. I said, now, come on, I ain't got no place to go, just come on, get in the car, and I'll take you any place you want to go. He said, no, I'm fine, I appreciate that. I said, well, okay, and I left. I didn't understand that, and I got a call from the group leader that later that afternoon. He had already drank a pint. He stopped at this gas station just down from there and bought a pint and had already downed that one and was walking. He did, that's why he didn't want to get in my car. He knew I'd smell it. And uh, I called him. I got his phone number and I called him and I told him, I said, Matt, I said, I heard about, he, they had to put him in the hospital. He had to go in de detox. And I said, Matt, I'll never forget you. And I said, if you ever need anything, you call me, you let me know. You've got my number in your phone now. And I mean it. And for like a year, about every three months or so, I'd call him, just check on him, see how he's doing. You never know what kind of effect you will have in somebody's life. But they basically, and by the time Daniel 5 come around, they practically dug Daniel up out of the old folks' home, and they said, we know a guy. And a guy can, if anybody can read that on the wall, it's going to be Daniel. In verse 16, And I have heard of thee, that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Look at that. Now if thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou should be clothed with scarlet. Daniel didn't care about none of that, but he was going to read the writing. 
And I, I just am curious this morning, how many people look to you for the things that they need in life? How many people come to you for help? How many people come to you because they see in you somebody that's wise, somebody that will tell them the truth, somebody that will give them uh, things that they need to know? And I'm, I'm not talking about somebody that's perfect. I'm talking about somebody that, because wisdom only comes to people who have learned knowledge and understanding. And the knowledge and understanding usually comes when we do stupid stuff and we find out that it doesn't work. And that we actually did more damage than we did good. And so they come to us because wisdom comes with age. Age represents experience. And they know that you've been through some things like they've been through. They want to know how you got through it. And you were able to tell them, this is how God brought me through this. In the book of Acts, look at this. When you have wisdom, you will be hated. Mark it down. There arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians and them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. They were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. When you are witnessing to somebody or talking to somebody, counseling somebody, God will give you wisdom in your mouth that they will not be able to argue with. And how, how would you like to have that with friends that you know of or family members that you're trying to talk to? You're trying to talk them in off the ledge for crying out loud. And you give them things, wisdom from God that they cannot argue with. And hopefully they will surrender to it. Then they suborned men. That, that word means to lure, procure, or bribe someone to commit a crime. They suborned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him, this is about Stephen, and saw his face as had been the face of an angel. I just wonder how people see you when they look at you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Don't try to be smart in the world's way. Go ahead and give them the preaching of the cross. If they're doomed to perish, they're not going to believe it no matter what you say. No matter how nice things you wrap it up in, they're not going to believe it no matter what. But if that person is looking for a change in their life, I promise you, you give them the cross, they'll run to it. Uh, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And this is what I wanted to get across to you today. is yet You stop using the wisdom of this world. Quit watching the news. Amen. That lying bunch is going to tell you a bunch of nonsense. They're going to tell you a bunch of stuff. You can say, well, I only watch Fox. They're the... Quit watching that stuff. That stuff will eat you up. Um... I hadn't watched the news since the last election, and uh, Steve uh, took me to a Cardinal baseball game last year, and I'm sitting there, and I heard him call Albert Pujols, and I went, Albert Pujols, what's he doing? I didn't know he signed up for his last year to play with the Cardinals. He'd been playing with them all year long. I hadn't watched nothing. I felt like I was in the 2000s, like in the 90s, like, man. He said, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of what? Preaching. To save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified and the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Let me close with this. I know that it is my responsibility 
to say things that are right, that are true, that things that I understand and know from the scriptures, and to try to convey the wisdom that God wants to give me to give to you. You can either support that by your attendance, by your encouragement, by you saying amen every now and then. You can encourage that or you can speak against it. There was a guy that went to this church several years ago. I did not know this. I thought he was right there with me. That he would sit and say amen in the preaching. And when he got out in the car, he would, he would turn that off and turn something else on and tell his wife, Hoggard's an idiot. Hoggard's a, he's, he's an idiot. I bet Lisa writes half of his sermons. I, I just can't stand that guy. I can't stand listening to him. It just drives me nuts. He would say that to his wife. He'd say that in front of his children. I know it happens. I know it happens. Everybody's got an opinion about what the preacher should and should not do, what he should say and should not say, what he needs to keep hands off. If I'm, if I'm staying in this book and I'm giving you what this book has to give, it becomes your wisdom to support it. Invite people. And we've got it fixed up to where they don't even have to show up here the first few times. They can watch online. That way they can sit in privacy and say, oh, I can't stand that kind of preaching. I'm not going there. Or... They can say, you know, I've never heard preachers talk like that before. So it's up to me to give the wisdom. It's up to you to be wise enough to agree to it, to support it. I didn't say pay me. I said support it, to pray for me. That even if I'm wrong about something or you think I'm wrong about something, we'll handle it God's way. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. No, one, oh, no. Oh, I thought I had the book of James in here. I don't. The book of James tells us, if any among you lack wisdom... Let him ask it of God, who giveth to all men liberally. It's the only place in the Bible where God's a liberal. Amen? It's where, if you need wisdom, ask for it from God. And listen, stay away from this world's wisdom. Don't read your horoscope. Don't read Dear Abby. That's, boy, that's showing my age. Don't, don't easily consent to what somebody posts on Facebook or Instagram unless you absolutely know it 100% to be biblically true. Be careful what you consent to on social media. Okay? Father in heaven, I love you. I thank you for this church. I love this church. This church is my life. It is who I am. It's what I am. Father, I never, ever in this life want to be separated from this church. I love the people. I love the people that you've given to us here. And I love you, Father, for allowing me to be part of it. Lord, I want to be a blessing to this church. I do. It could, it could be the other way, and I don't want that. I want to be a blessing to each and every one that's here, 
I want you to be a blessing to them, to their children, to their grandchildren. I want you to bless this church and to give this church wisdom, a spirit of wisdom, so that, Lord, when serious decisions need to be made, we make them the right way and we make the right choices and the right decisions. Somebody's soul could depend on it. Somebody's everlasting soul and where they spend eternity could hinge upon something that we do or don't do here in this church. So, Father, I pray that you give us all that spirit of wisdom so that we follow in your footsteps always and the things that we do they're right in the eyes of the Lord not the eyes of the world bless us dismiss us now we pray in Jesus name and all of God's people said amen, amen. God bless you you are dismissed come back three o'clock we'll do it all over again shake hands be friendly